Great to see you all here this morning. It's always fun as we kind of come to the end of August and start to see people returning kind of each week and uh, just feels like everybody kind of coming back sometimes after some time away. As we wrap up our summer series on Romans, I want to encourage you to listen to these words that the Apostle Paul wrote to his protege Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you ever read that scripture and wonder how that can be true about words that were spoken, written 2,000 years ago? The answer, I believe, lies in that phrase, God breathed. When we read God's word, we're not just reading ink and words on a page. We're interacting with the Spirit of God, who transcends time and place and circumstance and brings his word to life for us. Whenever, wherever we live, whatever circumstances we might find ourselves in, the Holy Spirit speaks his truth to our hearts through the words of Scripture. I won't say I do this every time, but as I read God's word in the morning, I try to pray something like that. Lord, as I read this this morning, I'm submitting myself to you and to your spirit, and I pray that your spirit would speak words of truth through these words that are written, but also between those lines. We've all had experiences where you read something in Scripture and God started to show truth to you that really didn't have maybe anything directly to do with the Scripture. I've had that with preaching where was I've shake, shook hands with people after the service and somebody said, I really loved it when you said this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't say it to them, but I'm thinking, I don't think I said that. Uh, I think God was speaking for that, speaking that. To drill down a bit further, I find the New Testament letters of Paul, John, Peters, and others to be especially applicable to our lives because their original audience, first century followers of Jesus, face the same challenge you and I face as we seek to live our lives for Jesus in the 21st century in a culture that often opposes relationship with Jesus. They and we live in the transitional time between when Jesus came to earth as a baby and lived on this earth and then died for our sins and rose to life and the time when he returns for his church. God's kingdom has come to earth through Jesus. As we read the New Testament, we see Jesus consistently declaring the kingdom of God has come. He goes on and he says, the kingdom of God is like this. And many of his parables, he, get parables, he gives examples of what God's kingdom is like. Jesus' kingdom is already here, but it won't fully arrive until Jesus returns for his church and makes everything new. And so you and I, just as first century believers did, live in that really kind of awkward or difficult in-between state. We live in the already, but not yet. Jesus' kingdom has already come, but it's not yet fulfilled. And living in that world means that we engage with the world and its people while also remembering this life isn't all there is for us. And that's a very difficult space to walk in because everything we hear from people around us, from social media, from television, everything tells us live in the moment. You know, carpe diem, seize the day. Everything that matters or really important happens right now. Make this moment count. And yet, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom as well, we believe This life isn't all there is. We believe that we're laying up treasure for a kingdom that's yet to come. At the beginning of last Sunday's sermon, I read Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. And I want to read these verses for us again because they really do set the stage for what Paul writes about in the last couple chapters of of Romans. He writes, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
Let us behave decently in the daytime, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. I read that to you last Sunday in the sermon, and I reread it this week as I was preparing for the message because I felt like it kind of sets the stage for all that Paul talks about in the last three chapters of Romans. And as I read over those verses, I realized that Paul references light and darkness day and night fairly, fairly frequently in his letters. Talks about it clearly in that passage I just read. And here are several other examples that he writes about in other letters. For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. It's from Ephesians 5. In Philippians 2, we read these words. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light, children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. A challenge that Paul gives in Romans and throughout his letters is to live our lives with a sense of urgency. Not just caught in the flow of the stream and kind of going along with the flow of the world, if you will, but focusing on Christ and his purposes. Living with a sense of urgency. Understanding the importance of living as children of light in a dark world. Focusing on Jesus and his desire for us in a culture with values that are diametrically opposed to Jesus' life and his ways. So how do you and I live in the already but not yet? I mean, that's easy to kind of talk about, easy to say, but how do we actually do that? How do we live as people of light in a dark world? This may seem like a simplistic answer, but we take our cues from Jesus and God's word rather than the values and messaging of our culture and those around us. As Paul says in, in uh, Romans chapter 12, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Another translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Against this backdrop, I want to encourage you to follow along as I read Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. And as I read, please pay special attention to the words that I've bolded. Now, I just want to say on the front end, I was two-thirds of the way through writing this message when it dawned on me that Kristen was going to read the letter about my uh, accepting a five-year contract. And it wasn't until this morning as I was here, because I missed last week's staff meeting, I had some other... Uh, responsibilities with our denomination uh, teaching a course, it didn't occur to me today that we are going to commission that care team that we commissioned. And so as I think about this message, I, I think it's really fitting that both of those happen today 
Because this really is a message that focuses around life in Christ's body. And I, and I think that's a very important uh, challenge for each of us. And, you know, one of the things about Paul's letter that really comes through loud and clear is his incredible heart of love and concern that he has for the churches. Paul kind of had the reputation of being really kind of rough and tough church planner who endured a lot of stuff. Uh, he, you know, if, if he thought he had something that was truth, he wasn't afraid to go head to head with people who wanted to disagree with that. But he has an incredibly tender heart for the people that he pastored and for the churches that he planted. And so I think that will come through as we think about these words and apply them to our context here at McBick. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 9 of Romans chapter 15. Paul says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As is true of all of Romans, there's so much in those verses that it's difficult to unpack it all in a few moments. But I want to lift out some of the statements that Paul makes. You'll also notice that there's some overlap from chapter 14 that we studied last week, Paul again calls on us to bear with the shortcomings and failings of others, particularly those who are weak in their faith. And he calls us not to do this for our good, but for the good of others, to build them up. And last week I explained that common first century dilemma of followers of Jesus not knowing what to do when it came to eating meat in their culture, because so much of the meat had been dedicated or consecrated to pagan gods and goddesses or to idols. And so when you bought meat from a butcher or when you went into a home and were served meat, you didn't know if that meat had been consecrated to idols. And so some people who were new converts to Christianity, knowing very well what those pagan practices were like, said, I'm just going to play it safe and not eat meat at all. I'm just going to eat vegetables. Others like Paul, who had been followers of Jesus for a long time, said, hey, it's just meat, and my life's consecrated to God. I'm not going to just eat vegetables because of what somebody else might have prayed over that meat. I'm fine eating meat, is what Paul said. And so there was this uh, division at times between how to handle that, between new believers and those maybe who had been in their faith in Christ for a long time. And so that's kind of the context that Paul's writing about here in chapter 15 as well as in 14. And Paul's response to all of that was, whether you eat vegetables or meat really doesn't matter to me. Don't let differences of opinion on disputable matters divide you. And that was really the place where I wanted to get traction for us last week was, don't allow disputable matters to divide us. You know, we're well aware that there are many things that you and I could have differences of opinion on that would send us into different camps in arguments, and we could end up getting upset at each other. And yet in the church, Jesus says, and Paul says, don't let disputable matters divide. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Find our unity in him. And in him, the differences of opinion that we have on some of these other matters take a back seat, and we're able to focus on the unity that we have in Christ. In these verses, Paul says, we bear with one another's weaknesses, and we accept them because that's what Jesus modeled for us. And as we do that, <clears throat> we bring praise and glory to God. In between calling us to bear with the failings of the weak and to accept one another as Christ accepted us, 
Paul asked God to give us endurance and encouragement to give us the mind of Christ so that with one mind and one voice we might glorify God. There's that, that call again to unity, focusing on Christ, that we're unified with him and then we're enabled to glorify God together. He asked God to strengthen us so we might glorify him in unity. As we focus on God, as we worship him together, we're able to lift our eyes from the differences that have the potential to divide us and focus on our unity in Jesus Christ. When I think about those statements, bear with the failings of the weak and accept one another just as Christ accepted you, I can't help but be grateful for what God has given us here at McBick. It brings me great joy to see how our church family walks with people through difficulties. Ministries like At the Cross Recovery, Healing Prayer Ministry, and Dad Connection do a great job of accepting people wherever they are, extending grace to them, and walking them toward healing and restoration in Jesus. Uh, Pastor John King, the gentleman who gave the announcements this morning, uh, who uh, we're going to be celebrating next week at the, uh, the picnic. And as, as we kind of gather for our end of the season picnic, we're going to be celebrating John's 19 plus years of ministry. Uh, John's been instrumental in turning our hearts toward people in their brokenness and helping them to find restoration and healing, this healing in Christ. Ever since John came here, that's really been his heart. He began a ministry cross called Crosswalk that met here on a Sunday evening that really ministered deeply to people who were hurting and broken. He, he then through that, uh, through a series of different ministries, landed on something called At the Cross Recovery, currently a recovery ministry in our church that's also been started at a church in New Cumberland. And there are numbers of you who are on the board of that ministry and who volunteer there. And the goal is for that ministry to expand so that there are different At the Cross Recoveries in different sites on various nights of the week. So John's been intr instrumental in helping us uh, grow in that. Even beyond specific ministries, though, like the ones I've mentioned, I see examples of people bearing with the failings of others and accepting them as Jesus did, playing out in so many ways in the lives of our church family. I routinely hear about individuals and small groups and ministry teams and Bible fellowship groups caring for people in their midst. You know, I say this to you fairly often, but if this church only was made up of the ministries that I came, a, came up with, it probably wouldn't want to be a church where you'd want to hang out. So much of the good stuff that happens here comes through ideas, not just from our staff, but from people within the church who have ideas and who really uh, kind of serve on the front lines in caring for and ministering to people. And I hear about examples of this all the time. There's a lot more that I'd love to share with you as I hear them, but I don't want to break anonymity, and so sometimes we just have to kind of keep those to ourselves. But we routinely hear about amazing things that people and groups within our church are doing as they accept and, and reach out to and care for people within this church family. Another situation that I see play out a number of times in our church is with couples who have walked through a divorce. And in those situations, it's easy to take sides. But I've consistently watched teams of people minister to both the husband and the wife in those situations, seeking to bring health to individuals and also reconciliation in the relationship. And often I've seen churches frequently kind of split over that where one party, one spouse is thought to be right and the other one kind of has to leave because everybody thinks they're in the wrong. Now, there may well be one person more guilty of the other, but in a relationship breakdown, there's always fault that kind of goes both ways. And one of the things that I've always appreciated is watching us being able to walk with both parties and even at times have both of them continue as part of this body, even though they're walking through a very difficult situation together. I commend us for bearing with the failings of the weak, for accepting others as Jesus did, and for caring for those outside of Christ as well. And one of the things that Jesus told us, and we touched on this last week in John chapter 14, and right after the... Um, 
the Last Supper, he said, A new command I have for you, love each other as I have loved you. In this way, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so the love that we share isn't just important for the people that we love. It's not just important for the health of the body and relationships within the body. It's a witness to those who are outside of Christ, who see that and recognize that that doesn't normally happen. That when people love each other and accept each other and bear with each other's failings and are able not to divide over differences but unite in Christ, there's something significant going on there that points them to God. At the end of the passage that I just read, Paul writes about Jews and Gentiles. Remember that Paul's primary audience in Romans is Jewish Christians. Paul himself was a Jew, but the calling that God placed on him was to be a missionary to the Gentiles. A calling that incidentally often made Jews mistrust Paul. I want to start reading again in the middle of verse 9 and see what Paul says more from verses 9 through 12 about um, Jesus' ministry to both Jews and Gentiles. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. The gospel of Jesus that Paul preaches is fulfilling God's covenant with his people, the Jews. And it's also fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies that Gentiles would also follow God. The story of the Old Testament is God setting apart his people Israel as a holy nation, a separate people. But his desire was never that his relationship with those people would end with the Jews. His desire was, his intention that people all across the world would know his love and walk in relationship with him as they got to see his, uh, as they got to see it play out among the Jewish people. One of Paul's primary messages throughout the New Testament letters is that the good news of Jesus has now been made available to Gentiles as well as Jews. It's no longer just a Jewish thing or an Israelite thing. The gospel of Jesus is available to everyone. And then seemingly out of nowhere, Paul writes an amazing statement of prayer. And if you're familiar with Paul's letters, you'll be reading along and frequently you'll see it's almost like he can't contain himself. He's writing along and he just kind of bursts forth with praise and and has an amazing statement of thanksgiving or prayer in the middle of this writing. And that's kind of what happens here. Listen to this uh, prayer of praise for God's people. And, And as I invite you... I want to invite you to read these words aloud with me. If we can have those on the screen, Romans 15, 13. Um, There we go, 15, 13. Let's read those words aloud, ready? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is God's words for all times and places. But parts of it were also written to groups of people in specific times and places. One of the things I love about the Apostle Paul's letter is their personal nature. His heart for people comes through. As I mentioned earlier, Paul loves the people in his churches. And he writes these letters out of a pastor's heart that they would thrive in Christ. Listen again to these words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I know a number of us here this morning are facing significant physical challenges. Others are walking through emotional and spiritual crises. Some are dealing with hard relational issues. Others are struggling with jobs or financial concerns. Some students are dealing with anxiety about returning to school or going off to college for the first time. Parents who are undoubtedly struggling with the emotions of sending kids off to school, whether parents of kindergarten children or parents of first-year college students. 
to all of us, Paul writes these words, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Over the past several weeks, John King and I have preached some challenging messages. Two weeks ago, John challenged us from Romans chapter 13 about our relationship with government. Last week, I exhorted us, based on Romans 14, to love others in spite of our differences and always pursue unity. And today, based on Paul's words in Romans chapter 15, I've challenged us to live as people of light in a dark world. These aren't any easy challenges for any of us, including those of us who have been preaching. As I give these difficult challenges, I want you to know that as your pastor, I love you, I'm proud of you, and I'm excited to continue walking together in experiencing Jesus and sharing his love with others. I have a chance in my role as pastor and connecting with pastors in our community and in some of the work that I do with our, our, our Brethren in Christ local conference and denomination, I, I interact with pastors a lot, and I hear a lot about churches, the good, the bad, and the ugly. McBick isn't perfect, and neither is your lead pastor or your staff, but the more I interact with pastors and hear about other churches, the more grateful I am for who McBick is and for your openness to embracing what God is doing in your lives, in our church family, and in the community around us. I can't say this enough, but Pastor Jen was in the class that I taught this week, and uh, Chuck Arnold was there, and some other people that are pretty familiar with our church. And I expressed to them in private conversations, one of the things I struggle with at times in teaching that class is as I'm talking about God's calling for my life and how that plays out in the life of our church and how you all as a church family interact with me and with each other, I find myself feeling like I'm uh, bragging or holding up a standard that other people can't relate to. And I'm thinking, is this, is this helpful for people who are really feeling beaten down, feeling like they're in difficult church situations? And so I try to temper that by saying, hey, all of us are in different places, and we all have journeys that God has us on. But I, I want to share with you that I often feel extremely grateful for what God is doing here, for your openness to me and to our staff in ministering to you, for allowing God to work in your lives, for the way we interact together as a church family. Somebody said to me, somebody raised their hand this week, and it was a good question, and said, what do you do on your church board if two people are interacting inappropriately with each other, like if they're being contentious. And I, I looked at him and I was like, um, I'm not sure. Like, I don't see that happening. And again, we're people, we're flawed, I'm flawed, our staff is flawed. I can give you a list of their flaws. No. Um, <laughs> we all have our weaknesses, but we're developing a community where people don't interact inappropriately with each other. And if they do in a small group or in a Bible fellowship group, people confront that in love, saying, this isn't the way God wants us to interact with each other. And so I told this, uh, the guy who asked the question, like, honestly, I don't know, but if it came up, we'd address it. Because that's not, that's not appropriate. And I share that with you, I hope, to help you understand how grateful I am for you all, and for what God is doing here at McBick, and for the way you allow me not only to pastor you, but also to be involved in this broader community and, and to, to interact with other churches and pastors in our conference. I'm blessed to pastor this church, and I appreciate and I love you. And I resonate with the words of the Apostle Paul that he wrote in Romans 14 to 17. They're fitting words to close out this sermon. And I took the liberty of changing just a few words. I indicated them in brackets, and so you'll see where I make some changes. I really didn't have to do much. To make these words more personal, I'd like to share this with you. Paul writes these words, again with a few minor changes. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again 
because of the grace God gave me to minister as a minister of Jesus Christ to you. He gave me the pastoral duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that you might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. As I read those words, I thought, yeah, that's my heart for you all as a church. As Jesus' body, you and I are called to love, accept, and bear each other's burdens. To include and to build each other's up. So that individuals can find healing and wholeness in Jesus. And in the process, our church family is strengthened. And those who don't know Jesus have an opportunity to get a glimpse of who he is. And hopefully to move toward relationship with him. I want to invite the worship team to come up. I'd like to pray for us this morning. Lord, I thank you for this church family. I thank you that this is your church. Lord, there are times when I've struggled with that understanding when I've been um, wrestling with things that are happening or, or what's going on, and yet you've reminded me frequently that this is your church, these are your people, and the vision that we pursue is your vision. God, we declare that to you this morning, and I thank you that this church family is pursuing your heart. I thank you for the way they allow me and our staff and others to minister to them for the way they engage in loving each other and in pursuing unity, for the openness they have to sharing Jesus' love in the community, not only locally, but also around the world. God, I thank you for this church family, and I pray that you would continue your good work among us. As Paul says in Philippians 1, that you would bring to completion the good work you've begun. I thank you for your love for us, Lord. I thank you for the love of this church family. I thank you for all that you're doing here. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.